it's a delight to be with you uh, today and a privilege to follow on from, um, from Gary's presentation. Some of what I'm going to be sharing uh, will build on, uh, on what Gary has said in the same way that um, um, in my own research and in the books I published, uh, I was deeply indebted to Gary for his uh, research. And I hope that my presentation will prepare the ground for Gerald's presentation in the same way that his books are now on the IVP uh, list in place of mine. So um, I'm looking forward to what Gerald has to say too this morning. Um, you should have had an outline, which uh, if you fall asleep will cover most of what I'm going to be saying this morning. Um, but I want to begin with um, an introduction and, uh, and share three affirmations, three denials and three questions, just to warm us up uh, and you become familiar with my accent. Um, three affirmations, three rejections, and three questions which reflect where I'm coming from, so you know how, which box to put me in. Um, my first affirmation, and my clickers uh, decided to reject me. Here we go. I affirm the scriptures as the infallible, inspired word of God. Uh, the scriptures are inspired, they are infallible. Uh, in, and they are inherent in all matters of faith and doctrine. That's where I come from, a conservative evangelical position. And therefore I reject replacement theology, the idea that the church has replaced Israel. Um, I do not believe that. I don't believe there's any biblical precedent for that. Uh, the church is not the new Israel. New Israel is not a biblical term. But my question to you as we begin is, does God have one people or two? Simple question. Does God have one people or two? The second thing that I affirm is that the Hebrew Scriptures are about Jesus Christ. If you don't see Jesus as central to a book of the Old Testament, you have not understood it. He is on... Uh, Carly Billetton, the Finnish evangelist, used to say, study the Scriptures until you see the smiling face of Jesus on every page. He is central. Uh, and in the uh, post-resurrection encounter with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, Jesus says, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them everything that was written about himself in all the scriptures. So that's the second assumption I made. On the basis of that, I reject Christian Zionism. I don't believe the church has replaced Israel, but neither do I believe Israel has replaced the church. Uh, and if we follow some of the early Zionists, people like John Nelson Darby, Darby claimed that the church was a parenthesis to God's continuing purposes for Israel. The idea that somehow the church was plan B and that the promises of the Hebrew scriptures are applied today almost as if the coming of Jesus was unnecessary. So my question to you on that basis is, was the coming of Jesus the fulfillment or the postponement of the promises God made to Abraham? Fulfillment or postponement? Again, it's a straight question. It's either or. And my third affirmation is... coming, <laughs> that I affirm that we are all created in the image and likeness of God for whom Christ died. Therefore, I reject all forms of racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and all of the others. Uh, and my question to you on the basis of that is, what is the relationship between Israel and the church? And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. What is the relationship between Israel and the church? And we're going to look at seven of the most popular affirmations made by Christian Zionists, and we're going to deconstruct each of them from the Scriptures. And you have an outline, so you know where we're going. Not all Christian Zionists affirm all seven, but they, are, they reflect the DNA of Christian Zionism as a historic and contemporary movement. And I liken uh, this theology to a balloon with hot air. How many pins do you need to burst a balloon? I'm going to give you seven. Take your pick. Anyone will do. Because we're not playing table tennis. This isn't a spiritual ping pong. I've got my verse, and my Zionist friend has got his verse, and I've got another verse, he's got another verse. It's not like that at all. And that's why I've, I've got my Coke and my Sprite here. The Christian Zionists love the unconditional promises. I give you this land as an everlasting inheritance. And they major on that, just as Orthodox Jews do. So imagine the unconditional promises are the sprites. But what you find in Scripture are conditional clauses. Anyone who is not circumcised will be completely cut off from God's people. And when you add conditional clauses to unconditional promises, 
what do you get? You get conditional promises. And when you've got conditional promises, you can't go back to the unconditional ones. It may taste funny, but it's, un it's conditional promises. I'll put this down so it doesn't ruin the video. It ruined my shirt just about 10 minutes ago, so I went and got a clean one up. Um, so let's look at this, because what we're going to do is we're going to burst a bubble seven times, burst a balloon seven times. Any one of these is good enough to destroy the basis of um, a, 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 literal Christian, a, a, literal, a literal Christian Zionist perspective. And the first one is this. Does God bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel? Where does this, uh, this assumption, this assertion come from? Well, Gary, um, uh, and then we're going to look at the, the God's chosen people. Uh, are they synonymous with the Jewish people? Then we're going to look at the promised land. Was it given by God as an everlasting inheritance? Then we're going to look at Jerusalem. Is it their exclusive, undivided, eternal capital? Then we're going to look at the uh, Jewish temple. Must it be rebuilt before Jesus returns? And then we're going to look at the rapture. And I'm going to ask you a, a basic question. And, um, and, then, and then we're going to review what we've learned this morning and uh, whether God has a separate plan for Israel from the church. So let's look at these one at a time. And they're based on my book, uh, Zion's Christian Soldiers. Um, it's available secondhand on Amazon if you want to pay money, but you can also get it on, um, on Kindle uh, for a lot less. And if you go to my website, you can access most of it for free anyway. So let's look at this first uh, affirmation. Does God bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. Where does this assumption come from? Well, it comes back, uh, we go right back to Genesis 12, and one of the promises God made to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, I'll make your name great, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was one of the, the first promises God made to Abraham. And then he reiterates it in Genesis 22. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And, all, and through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed. The question is whether these promises apply to Abraham's physical descendants, unconditional or in perpetuity. And with every profound statement in Scripture, we have to look back into the Scriptures to see how they are understood. And what we find is that the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3 is very explicit in explaining what these promises actually mean. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, these promises, uh, Paul says, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he almost anticipates how this Scripture would have been twisted and distorted because he says scripture does not say and to seeds meaning many people but to your seed meaning one person who is Christ so the seed of Abraham is Christ it's explicit there's no way around it and then he goes on to say verses 28 29 there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so I want you to visualize it in this way. We must read the Old Testament through the eyes of Jesus. We must read the Old Testament through the New Testament grid. And when we do that, we find that Jesus is central to all that the Scriptures teach. Uh, Jesus challenged uh, the Pharisees, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you have eternal life. These are the scriptures that speak about me. And that's why they had gone astray, because they didn't see Jesus as central to the scriptures. And that certainly applies to this first um, affirmation, which I hope you've realized we've been able to burst but let's look more controversially at the second, which is, are the Jewish people God's chosen people? And even to question this almost sounds heretical, or dare I say it, anti-Semitic. And what I find in Scripture, and I hope you will uh, appreciate too, is that both the Hebrew and the Christian Scriptures insist membership of God's people has always been open to all races on the basis of grace, not race. You see, that one letter, G, makes all the difference between race and grace. 
Let me just give you a few examples. I want you to see that in the Hebrew Scriptures, God's people was always inclusive. Always inclusive. Do not despise the Edomite, for the Edomites are related to you. Do not despise the Egyptians, because that you resided as foreigners in their country. The third generation of children born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. So the Jordanians and the Egyptians were welcomed into the people of God on the basis of their faith, not their race. This is elaborated, sorry, in um, Isaiah 56. Now, just reflect on this. This is God speaking. Let no foreigners who've bound themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Now, why would people say that? If God says, let no foreigner say it, why would they be saying it? Think about that. The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Why would they think that if the Lord says, don't think it? They thought it because the Lord's people were doing the excluding. They were doing the excluding. Notice he says, Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. An inclusive people. Another passage. You know the Feast of Purim is based on the story of Esther, this amazing story of God's providence as he delivers his people out of the clutches of their enemies. And if we look at Esther 8 verse 17, we see what happened. We see the origin of the celebration. After their victory over their enemies, it says in every province and every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. But what happened next? The second half of the verse, and many people of other nationalities became Jews. How many is many? How many nationalities? We don't know, but many sounds like many. It means by the time of Esther, to be identified as a Jewish person did not automatically mean that you were a descendant, a physical descendant of Abraham, because being incorporated within the people of God was on the basis of grace, not race. Do you see that? It's there in the scriptures in black and white. So any idea that we identify the term Jew with a racial descent to Abraham is undermined by the very Hebrew scriptures. When we come to the New Testament, we find precisely the same. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 8 warns, uh, as he began to experience resistance, insists Uh, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and they will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about the Jewish diaspora. He's talking about the Gentile nations. He says the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, those, that is, who've rejected him. The feast of Abraham is open to all who acknowledge the God of Abraham. And when we get to Romans, as you know, in Romans 2, Paul defines the word Jew in spiritual terms, not physical terms. And in Romans 11, sorry, Romans 9, he does the same with the term Israel. Israel is not to be identified solely or purely on the basis of race, but the true Israel is on the basis of faith, grace through faith. It is through Isaac, your offspring, be reckoned. In other words, it's not the natural children who are God's children, but the children of the promise who are to be regarded as Abraham's offspring. Now, this is how we typically understand uh, race today. This is very superficial, I know. But we have uh, the Jewish people, uh, 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 an Israel descended from Isaac, uh, uh, from Sarah. And then we have Hagar who gave birth to Ishmael and the Arab tribes. But the Apostle Paul in Galatians does something very radical to this paradigm. He says in in Galatians, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. Who's the our? The Galatian believers, Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus. So what is Paul doing? 
He's saying that the Jerusalem that's rejected Jesus are the children of Hagar, and you who believe in Jesus, Jews and Gentiles, are the spiritual descendants of Sarah through the promise. But he goes one stage further. He says, like Isaac, you are the children of promise. And then he goes one stage further because he says, he quotes Sarah's insistence to Abraham that he get rid of Hagar. They cannot live in the same house. Paul uses it to say you cannot mix law and grace. Get rid of the legalists who insist on circumcision in order to be a faithful member of God's people. We are not children of the slave woman, he says, but of the free woman. So he's done something really radical to this, to this um, paradigm, if you like, of Sarah and Hagar. In the New Testament, the word chosen is used exclusively of the followers of Jesus. It's as simple and profound as that. Colossians 3, 1 Peter 2. As God's chosen people, Jews and Gentiles, who believe in Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, he was the sole remnant of Israel, I believe. Isaiah 53 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Christ died on the cross, how large was the faithful remnant? The disciples had all run away. At the cross, there were three individuals who stood with Jesus. Mary, his mother, Mary Magdalene, and John. But respectfully, I ask, were they singing when I survey the wondrous cross? They were not singing a hymn of praise. They didn't understand. They needed a savior too. I believe that when Christ died on the cross, he was Israel. It was reduced down to one man, the thread. But we'll come to that. What about the land? Well, we've enjoyed uh, Gary's presentation this morning. I'll try and build on that. Um, was the promised land given by God exclusively to the Jewish people as their inheritance? goes back to the promise God made uh, to Abraham in Genesis 15. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. And that promise um, drove many of the early Zionists. This is a map from uh, Theodor Herzl. Um, that was the conviction, that was the promise, and that was what was uh, claimed. Now, the fact is, those were virtually the borders under, under David and under Solomon. There are references to uh, the uh, Euphrates and cities on the Euphrates and Egypt uh, 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 marking out the boundaries of the kingdoms of David and Solomon. So they were fulfilled. But what I want to emphasize is that the land always belong to God. You know there's a fundamental problem if you buy a property and don't appreciate that you are only buying the leasehold. There's a, a qualitative difference between freehold and leasehold, isn't there? You might own the house, but if you don't own the land underneath the house, you're having to pay rent for the rest of your life, and it may go up. The land belongs to God. Leviticus 25, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. God allowed his people to live in the land as what? Tenants, strangers, aliens, because the land belongs to God. Residence in the land was always conditional. This is a, a passage from Ezekiel chapter 34. And again, it's almost as if the Lord is anticipating the arrogance that would go with might is right or conquest. Son of man, the Lord says, the people living in these ruins of the land are saying, scratching their head, Abraham was only one man and he possessed the land. We are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. Therefore say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it, you look to your idols and shed blood. Should you possess the land? You rely on your sword. You do detestable things. Should you possess the land? I will make the land a desolate waste. Her pride strength will come to an end. There's a fundamental principle in the prophets. Obey and you can stay. Rebel and you're out. Repent and you can return. But it was always conditional on faithful obedience to God's revelation. And more profound still, the inheritance 
God insisted, was to be shared. It was not exclusive. Notice again, this passage from uh, Ezekiel 47. In three verses, God has to say the same thing three times. When God says something once in Scripture, it's true. When God says something twice in two verses, it's important. But why on earth would God have to say the same thing three times in three verses? The obvious reason is because his people wouldn't believe him. Notice what he says. You are to distribute this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. You are to allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the foreigners residing among you who have children. It's coming. I hope. Yes. Here we go. You are to consider them as native-born Israelites along with you. They are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe a foreigner resides, there you are to give them their inheritance. Three times, he says, share the inheritance. It was on the basis of faith, grace through faith, not on the basis of an unconditional exclusive promise. When we come to the New Testament, remarkably, we find exactly the same thing emphasized. When we look at uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, uh, we find the history of the Old Testament saints. And uh, uh, Abraham and his children are described. By faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, the promise of the land. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God, for they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what was promised, since God had prepared something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Now, who's the us and who's the they? The they are the Old Testament saints, and the us are those reading the book of Hebrews, the New Testament saints. One people of God, on the basis of grace through faith, not works or race. Abraham understood himself to be an alien and a stranger, and so must we. I liken the land to an airport runway. It was the means by which the the rescue plan of God revealed through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, um, was possible. It was the means by which the incarnation could take place. The coming of the Lord Jesus into our world to be our Savior. The conditions were attached. Jesus insisting, this is not my kingdom. Uh, My kingdom is of another place. Jesus sends the apostles out. The word is literally exodus. He kicks them out. They're never told to come back. They're told to take the good news to the whole world, just as Israel had been called to be the light of the Gentiles. Because the land was temporary. It was not their everlasting inheritance our place in heaven is. Okay, what about Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem gets the same treatment the land gets because Jerusalem was to be shared. Again, look at this, Psalm 87, three times, three times and three verses, God says the same thing. I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me, Philistia too and Tyre along with Cush, and will say this one was born in Zion. He's saying the Africans... The Iraqis, the, um, the Palestinians, if you like, or the Lebanese, and the Egyptians. This one was born in Zion. Indeed, of Zion it will be said, this one and that one was born in her, and the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord will write in the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion. Now, when you are born somewhere, you get something, usually. You get a passport. It identifies your nationality, your identity. You get it because you're normally, when you're born somewhere. Some don't, sadly. But God says that these surrounding nations, if they acknowledge me, it is as if they were born in Jerusalem, as if they were born in the land. Equal rights, equal citizenship. Jerusalem was to be shared. When we come to the New Testament, we find Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem and warning of its destruction because they had rejected him. As a, as a mother hen gathers her chicks, I've longed to protect you, longed to gather you, but you would not. And he says the same in Luke 19. He wept over Jerusalem. 
Jesus wept at their hardness of heart in resisting and rejecting him. As we look at the rest of the New Testament, the focus shifts away from the earthly Jerusalem, which is identified with Babylon. It's identified with the, 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 the enemy, if you like. And a new Jerusalem emerges. It is the Jerusalem that is above. And notice how Hebrews 12 insists we've already got citizenship. We're already citizens of heaven. We have eternal life on the basis of our trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something future. We have eternal life now. This is eternal life, said Jesus. John 17, 3. That men may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So we have citizenship in the new Jerusalem. And we have citizenship in the heavenly Jerusalem. It's a glorious picture in Revelation 21. So our focus in the New Testament is away from an earthly city and onto a heavenly one. We are pilgrims in a foreign land looking forward to enjoying our citizenship in eternity. What about the temple? Um, as I said, not all Christian Zionists would subscribe to this, but many of our dispensational friends do. And they insist that the temple has got to be rebuilt so that it can be desecrated by the Antichrist before Christ returns. Now, where do they get this idea from? Well, they get it from Daniel chapter 9 and, Revel uh, and Matthew 24, insisting that uh, something very profound is happening in these verses. Now, you may need a strong coffee to get this, but... Um, if you read uh, Daniel 9, 26 and 27, two things are happening here. Uh, in verse 26, we're told that the, that the temple will be destroyed. And then in verse 27, we're told the temple will be desecrated. Now, how can you desecrate something that's already been destroyed? You put 2,000 years between the two verses. And so verse 26 is the temple of Herod, and verse 27 is a future temple. Now, if you find that rather um, difficult to, uh, to believe, then you're not the only one. But this is the basis of the belief that the temple's got to be rebuilt. They do the same thing with Matthew uh, 24. But there is absolutely nothing in either text uh, or anywhere else in Scripture that suggests that a new temple is necessary. Uh, Josephus uh, labors the fact that this, this prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70. Uh, the, the, the temple was well and truly desecrated four times uh, by, the, by the Idumeans, by the zealots who, who murdered the high priest uh, in the temple. Uh, it was desecrated by the Romans uh, when they put their standards up in the, in the temple. Uh, it was desecrated several times before it was destroyed. No, these verses are describing the same event. The fact is the temple is under construction. In the New Testament, we are told that the temple is Jesus. Jesus is the temple. John chapter 2. Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. But the temple he'd spoken of was his body. When he came into the temple to clear out the money changes, he wasn't cleansing it. He was declaring it redundant because the temple had arrived. The means of atonement, the temple, the high priest, the ransom sacrifice, all bound up in one person the Lord Jesus, the mediator between God and a fallen world. The temple is under construction because in an awesome way, the New Testament insists that the body of Jesus is the temple. We are no longer foreigners and strangers. We are fellow citizens with God's people, members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus, the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is rising to become a holy temple in the Lord. Again, the apostle Peter says the same thing. We are living stones being built into a spiritual house. And he uses Old Testament analogies for the temple and applies them to the church. So the church is the temple under construction. We burst that one. And now we're going to have a bit of fun. Because, again, within our uh, dispensational friends, Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsay, the whole um, um, Armageddon uh, theology is predicated on the belief that there will be an end-time battle of Armageddon. And depending on whether you are a pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, whether you're a masochist or you don't like pain, um, you will believe that uh, you're going to be raptured to heaven before all hell breaks loose on earth 
Um, now, where does this idea come from? Well, first of all, there is no secret rapture. There is no basis for a secret rapture in Scripture. Over and over again, the emphasis is, even for those of us who are hard of hearing, that it will be, the return of Christ will be audible, visible, and unmistakable. It's very clear from Matthew 24, all peoples on earth will mourn when they see Christ Jesus when he comes. A loud trumpet call, and his elect will be drawn to him. Again, 1 Thessalonians 4, we find a loud command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God. It is going to be cataclysmic when Christ returns. No secret rapture. But what about this famous verse? Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one left behind. Two women will be grinding one in a handmill. One will be taken, one left behind. The question is, do you want to be taken or do you want to be left behind? Now, you've got a 50% chance of getting it right. Now, would you base your eternal destiny on, uh, on a flip of the coin? You want to be sure, darn sure, which way you're going to jump. So, let me embarrass you. Hands up if you want to be left behind. Okay. Okay. I feel really sorry for most of you. Let's look at this. There's always a context for a text. And you know, a, a text without a context is a pretext. And this is a pretext without a context. The context is crystal clear, crystal clear. Let's look at the context. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus is saying, just as it happened with Noah, it's going to happen. What's going to happen? In the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing. Who was the they? Was it Noah and his family? No, they knew what was going to happen. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and what? Took them all away. So you don't want to be taken or do you want to be left behind? <laughs> it's a serious question. Do you want to be taken or do you want to be left behind? Look at the context. As in the days before the flood, they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one left behind. It couldn't be plainer. And yet, this whole theology has got it 180 degrees round the wrong way. Haven't they? I want to be left behind. I don't want to be taken. And Jesus says the same thing in another parable he told in Matthew 13, uh, the wheat and the tares. Um, people came along and sowed tares among the wheat, and the uh, harvest has come to the master and says, do you want us to pull the tares up? He says, no, let both grow until the harvest. At that time, I tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and put it in my barn. Now, if you've got a Schofield reference Bible, look at the footnote to this verse, and Schofield has the audacity to turn it round and say, the believers will be taken first. He contradicts the verse, the very verse in the footnote. However we view the future, uh, Corrie ten Boom was asked whether she was pre-mill, post-mill, or a-mill. She said that's an a-preposterous question. <laughs> I really don't mind what's going to happen in the future. All I know is I want Jesus to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all that matters. And, 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 and you know, I get loads of books given me, uh, particularly by my wife. And um, you know what I do? I, I look at a book and I think, that's, that's going to take a long time to read. You know what I do? I read the last page. And if I like the last page, I'll read the book. If I don't like the last page, why waste time reading the book? It's like, you know, the heroine dies on the last page. Good grief. You know, I don't want to waste my life reading that book. The last page of the Bible says, paradise will be restored. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Whatever's going to happen in the future, the nations are going to be there, and they are going to be reconciled. And that's why we're called to be peacemakers. That's why we're called to a ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors for Christ. So finally, does God have a separate plan for the Jews apart from the church? Well, as we've looked at already, I believe the scriptures are emphatic. God has only ever had one people, one inclusive people. And what I've done in this picture is merge two illustrations, one from John 15, the vine and the branches, and one from Romans 11, the natural and the wild olive branches. Both are saying the same thing. 
I believe. Jesus is the root, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. And we are either natural branches with Jewish stock, or we are Gentile branches. We are either natural or wild. But the basis upon which we remain within the people of God, the covenant people of God, is on the basis of our relationship to Jesus and how we respond to him. Are we abiding in him? Are we bearing fruit? Because if we don't, we're not abiding and we'll be cast off. And in Romans 11, Paul warns the church in Rome, don't get arrogant, because if he could cut off the natural branches, he can cut you off too. And if he can graft you in as the wild branches, he can also regraft in the natural branches in the future. But it begs the question, if we, or if I, as a wild olive shoot, as a Gentile, have been grafted in among the others and share the nourishing sap of the olive root, into what or into whom have I been grafted? Does God have one people or two? It's the one people of God. That's certainly the emphasis of the New Testament. Notice the way that Paul in Ephesians describes Gentiles. Gentile believers in Jesus. He says, remember your history. Remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised. That's kind of a rude word, okay, by those who call themselves the circumcision. Remember that at that time you were what? Separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants, without hope, and without God in the world. That's, that's a pretty bleak position to be in. But, he says, now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. What are the two Jews and Gentiles? thus making peace in one body to reconcile them both of them to God through the cross by which he was put to death, put to death their hostility. The one inclusive people of God. Now, I said earlier about when Christ died on the cross, this is meant to be like one of those egg timers. You know, if you want a runny egg, you, uh, you've got wh whatever it is, two and a half minutes, three minutes. Um, and so the egg timer helps you to time the cooking of your egg. For me, the promises God made to Abraham in Genesis 12 find their fulfillment in the great multitude of every language, tribe, and nation in Revelation 7. And the question is, how do we get from Genesis to Revelation? Now, it's a bit like Monopoly. You must pass through go. You have to go round the board. And in this case, you have to go through Jesus. There's no plan B that takes you from the promises made to Abraham and apply them today without passing through Jesus. And the Old Testament is the top half of the egg timer. The New Testament is the bottom half. And over and over again, God has to refine and prune his people, a remnant. Remember when they came out of Egypt, every adult who came out of Egypt had survived the Passover because they'd put the blood on their doorposts. They had survived. But every single one of them died in the wilderness in rebellion, apart from Joshua and Caleb. It was only the children who entered the promised land. Over and over again in the Old Testament, God has to prune, has to refine his people. Only a remnant came back into the land from exile. So when Christ died on the cross, he, in my theology, was Israel. He was the remnant. He is the seed. And then through his resurrection and his ascension and Pentecost, he draws his disciples back to himself. He recommissions them and he sends them out. And we see the, the, the wonder of God's uh, work through the Acts of the Apostles in rebuilding his people of all nations into the one people of God. And we've got that blip in Acts 15 when the legalists want to impose circumcision and praise God, the Council of Jerusalem uh, reject that and insist that on, it's on the basis of grace through faith, not works and law. And so that's how we get to the great multitude. And we're somewhere between the Pentecostal church and the great multitude. We're not there yet. Um, and that's where we must persevere. And, and so to conclude, one final passage to reflect upon. Ephesians chapter 3. The mystery of Christ 
which has not been made known to people in other generations, as it has been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. At the beginning I said I repudiate replacement theology. The church has not replaced Israel. I repudiate Christian Zionism. Israel has not replaced the church because the church is Israel. The people of God, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints are one people on the basis of grace through faith, not race or works or law. That's my thesis. Thank you for being patient with me. I hope I've convinced you at least one of those pins was good enough to burst the bubble. Seven ways in which, um, seven affirmations often made by Zionists that I think on the basis of Scripture we can show well and truly uh, have no basis in Scripture. You can get this uh, from Amazon Kindle. You can access it through my website. And I encourage you to check out the charity that now um, um, uh, enables me to carry on ministering, peacemakers.ngo, find out some of the things we're up to. Thank you, and God bless you.